have here a lineup of cameras <clears throat> on the east, the west, and this is the origin of the single lens reflex, the exact camera from Dresden. So I'll talk about this little camera first because I'll say this is the origin. It has an unusual shape, as you can see, a trapezoidal shape. And very interesting the study of shapes of objects and out of a trapezoid is a very dark shape out of the dark shape comes a light so a lot of light coming out of a camera like this um, the exacta this is a single lens reflex camera because it has a housing on top but once upon a time this exacta did not have this this is what you call the pentaprism and the pentaprism was developed as an attachment, if you like, to the exacta. And they also built a 6x6 large format version, and there was a large format pentaprism too. So the large cameras came for the small cameras, I think, because the small cameras were the most difficult to engineer. Yeah? So the smaller the camera is, the higher level it is in the development of cameras, I suppose. And so the original exacta, I'll put that down. The original exacta, you looked down through the mirror and out the lens like that. That's how you looked at it. And I have a, a version of a camera that works like that. I'll show you that camera. This is from a, a later era than the original of this. And what happens is there is a focusing housing flips up and then there's also a, a magnifying glass here that um, allows you to focus. You can get close to focus and you can lift it up and you can compose from waist level like this if you like. It's quite a small image and it's quite awkward because what happens is you move the camera this way and the image moves the other way and so it's not, <laughs> it's not a very easy camera to get along with yeah and so professionals got used to it i suppose yet amateurs wanted something that they could look through the lens and of course the professionals too because the difficulty was with any camera the reason you want to look through the lens is because if you change the lenses, and these were interchangeable lens cameras, you could put a long focal length lens on like this, and then it, you have a whoops, you have a, a narrower angle of view, and you need to see that in the viewfinder. So the viewfinder shows you what the camera is seeing exactly, and that allows you to take the photographs that you require. So whilst this camera is I think from the 19, about 1960 this month, I think, they made these for quite many years from the 1930s. The first one didn't look too dissimilar to this. And this eventually, as I say, got the, um, the pentaprism later and was the first single lens reflex with the removable pentaprism and so on. And Anyway, to cut a long story short, why I'm talking about this one is because the cameras, both the Eastern cameras and the Western cameras, evolved from this camera, which was made by IRG uh, Company in Dresden, and the name of the camera is the Exacta model. Okay, so that's a background, really. I'll just take five. We talked about the monopolies that controlled the camera industry and the biggest player in the camera industry, believe it or not, was Carl Zeiss <laughs> and they had a company, their 
main camera company, which is where all the political activity is centered, was Zeiss Icon. And Zeiss Icon had a factory at Stuttgart. And this is where Kodak was. Kodak had moved into Germany in the 1930s, just about the same time that uh, George Co uh, Eastman, Co I don't know, the, the guy that ran Kodak, I'd have to look up the internet for that, but I know that he committed suicide about this time and the Kodak moved into Germany by buying up a German company, the Nagel company I think it was, and he put Nagel in charge of the company and Nagel patented everything on their behalf I suppose it was the way to get patents into Germany. And what they patented mainly was the 35 millimeter film canister. And um, Leica, Leica developed the cinema film idea, if you like. The Leica was the first small camera to use a roll film using cinema film. And at that time, they used to have to make the film, wind the film from a big bulk film onto the small um, cassettes, if you like, that, that Leica, you had to buy from Leica or from Contax. And so, you know, Eastman Kodak, Kodak had the idea to uh, patent their own canister and... Um, and so with the, with the idea to sell the film into the world, really. And Germany was a place where the best cameras in the world were made, really, at that time. And so it was a start, the 1930s, when the Leica was first came out, was the start of a, a whole new market of for photography of um, amateur and semi-professional um, artists and people like this um, general public moving towards a new format of photography. The old roll film cameras only used to take a few shots whereas on 35mm we could take 36 pictures. This was the main difference and this is why people wanted it and of course the film was probably about the same price as the other film, except you got 36 pictures instead of about 12. And so it was quite a big cost saving too. Now, with the improvement in lenses and, and this sort of thing, 35 millimeter eventually replaced the larger formats because you know, the technology got better. Um, in the same way that digital could do it with a smaller format also. Could replace the 35 millimeter format. We'll take a pause. Now we also talked about how the industry was centered around the F decal shutter of Comper, this Comper shutter. And over the course of time, all of the shutter companies, there was another shutter company that eventually became the biggest, but they were all owned by the same monopoly or consortium or what you would you call it? It's really a conspiracy against the consumer because the idea is that you eliminate the competition. You all work together, as ah, the word I'm looking for is as a cartel. You all work, work together as a cartel and the whole thing becomes a single monopoly. And this is the state of affairs. And I'm not going to go into the individual complexities of who took over who and what the names changed from what to what. Basically, they were all in it for the money. 
And so, if a company started up that produced something innovative, innovative and new, they would simply gobble it up and shut it down and stop them producing it. And so, for example, when um, Carl Zeiss wanted to respond to the Leica problem, because that was a problem for the rest of the players in the industry, they were making um, quite old-fashioned looking cameras with bellows in them. <laughs> I'll put a picture up. And now we have this sleek and neat uh, modern Leica <clears throat> that uh, this, this was put the fear of God into them. So um, this was announced in 1934 and it took uh, Zeiss six years to come up with a competitor for it. And within that time, Leica managed to sell 200,000 Leicas and became the standard in the industry. And so it had a very strong position at the time. But what the people wanted was a Leica body with the Carl Zeiss lens, because the Carl Zeiss lens was superior. Now, I had one of these <coughs> uh, older Leicas. I had an M2 when I was a student at photography school. I had an M2 Leica, but I also, because I was interested <coughs> in the history, I managed to find a cheap um, 3G, Leica 3G, which is pretty much like this, um, and I thought, well, that would be interesting to try that out. And maybe the body, you know, I thought, well, it's just going to be just as good and the body's smaller and so on. So I'll, I'll, I would like to give that a go. And I put, a, or I think I put one film through it. And there was no way that I was going to accept the quality that was coming out of that lens. It was just not good enough. And so So the Zeiss lens was king, really, of the world. And they weren't just making um, lenses for cameras, Zeiss. They were making the latest developments in telescopes. They had this huge, huge telescope that they built and uh, planetariums and all this stuff. They were the masters of lens production. And so nobody could beat them. They were the sharpest, the best lens. The Tessar design was incredible design and lasted for, for years and years, still produced today. So, what would they do? And, <clears throat> oh, yeah. And so, Zeiss uh, contacts, they studied the Leica. They, they got a guy, um, he actually became the guy that they, he was from the West, and they sent him over to, um, to, to uh, uh, Jena and Dresden, to work on a, a competitive product to the Leica. And they gave him the Leica, gave him all this stuff, and he took it apart and studied it. And, and his job was to create a, 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 a camera that could beat the Leica. And so what he came up with was the contacts. And that is a man that eventually was taken to the West by the Americans, and he ended up in the head of the Zeiss Oberkochen and the Zeiss um, company, he ended up heading it up. Now, when Zeiss came up with the contacts, they had a big fight with, with Deckel because Deckel, Deckel wrote a, a very strong letter to Zeiss about the monopoly and how he was breaking their um, agreement by making cameras with focal plane shutters and that he had to build it with a, with a, uh, with a comper shutter because, you know, they were the men who <laughs> made the shutters. And so, I keep on touching this camera, I don't know why. <laughs> Let's have a cap off. And so, The shutter that they designed for the contacts was a brand new type of shutter. It was a focal plane shutter that ran in the opposite direction to the one that the Leica used. And it was made out of a roller blind 
of, um, of metal. And so they were in a hurry to release this thing because all the time Leica was gaining ground with, a, with, the, with their sales and dominating this segment with this new uh, market and all their cameras were, nobody wanted them anymore because, you know, they were old hat. And so they had to rush this camera to market and it took them six years to get this camera to market. That was the, I don't have it here. Let's get it. That was the Kiev camera that was taken to Russia and made in Russia in the end. Okay. So they made the first of the contact of the Kiev cameras, they made the first of those in Germany and then moved the factory to Russia after the war. So something you notice I took the lens cap off when I watched the video back now as I was editing it I thought oh yes the next I have to talk about Voigtlander <coughs> lenses because this is an important part of the journey now we said that Zeiss was the best lens maker in the world but Voigtlander was also equally great lens building company and the Voigtlander lenses were renowned for their quality and sharpness. And also the build quality. The build quality was very good and Voigtlander cameras lasted for years. Look, this one is, this works perfectly. The lens still turns just as good as it ever did, unlike some of the Carl Zeiss lenses. And um, yeah, everything just works really well. So Voigtlander was the best lens making company in Germany and there were also some two other good ones too, were also very good, very sharp optics and this was Steinheil in München, Munich and um, Schneider Kreuschang in um, also southern Germany. And so they did have lens makers and a lot of people don't know that Schneider Ischko, Ischko Gottingen was part of the Schneider group there. So there were also Schneider lenses, really. And all these people were all, well, they were all part of the cartel. Um, Voigtlander was taken over in 1920 by the Shearing Chemical Company. They were probably linked up with IG Farben and all that. So um, they had their fingers in every pie. The monopolists, the globalists they were, <clears throat> and okay, so what happened after the war was the development of the single lens reflex camera. Now, I'm not going to go into that because that deserves its own chapter if you like. And so what I am going to talk about is the development of the single lens reflex in Western Germany because it took a different route. And after the war, they, when Zeiss 
icon was made again from nothing, created as a new company and the name stolen from East Germany and, and put onto this fake corporation that was making, now making cameras. They called it Zeiss Icon, but it wasn't really Zeiss Icon, the Zeiss Icon was finished, gone. And Zeiss' home, natural home, is in Jena, in East Germany. So, they started after the war, they saw that the East Germans were producing a single lens reflex camera, and they knew that they had to do the same thing themselves. So the cartel got together, and what they came up with was this object which is the single lens reflex camera copied if you like from what the developments in the west which was in the east which was copied from based on the exacto you can actually see the um, similarities if you like of the of the shape of the body and so on and everything a few differences uh, this was the origin of all single lens reflexes before the pentaprism. A single lens reflex doesn't have to have a pentaprism. Pentaprism is a, a special type of single lens reflex. So this is what they were developing after the war, the pentaprism single lens reflex, which what is what this is. And they decided to put, or they were ordered to put a compere shutter, which is a leaf shutter, in between the lens and the film. Okay, and so there's lots of advantages to this because what happens is you can hold this camera. This is a great camera, you know, make, make no words. The viewfinder is really, really good. Of all these cameras, of all these single lens reflex cameras from this age of camera, this one has the best viewfinder. It really, really is good. and. Even the light meter works and everything works in this camera. It's remarkable, really. It's a good, good quicker. It's very heavy. And so it's well made. What I don't like about it is its styling. It looks a bit like a coffin, you see. And it was. This was, if you like, the coffin of the death knell of the West German camera industry. Because after this camera, there was no... There was no um, German... West German camera industry anymore. This camera was the death knell of it. And how it died was that the, 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 the successful or the more financially successful stable um, companies in the cartel, they gobbled up the least stable ones and they just ate each other up until there was just Zeiss Icon in the end, an IG Farben, and Zeiss Icon. And that was the end of it all, really. And then they gave um, Rolly purchase what was left. Um, maybe Rolly wasn't as much a part of the cartel as everybody else. And then Rolly failed. And so that was the end of it. That was at Braunschweig, Braunschweig. Which is called Brunswick, I think, in English. But we don't ever use that name, seemingly. Okay, now the other development that it has on it, this camera, you'll see, is the lever wind. The lever wind was a later development, and the lever wind, I'll put on the screen the first camera with the lever wind, I can't remember exactly which one it was. You'll see there's a lever wind on this one, but this works in the opposite direction. This must have been the first iteration of that. This is an amazing camera. You you wind it on the side, uh, it's really unusual. And this thing turns around here. And then you've got to cock this thing oh, as tight as you can. Otherwise the slow shutter speed don't work. It's like clockwork. I don't know if you can hear that run. I'll do it again. This is where it came from. Okay, turn that around. Here we go, here we go. Oh, so here, over here, the shutter button's over here. Alright. Very well engineered, though. 
built like a tank, looks a bit like a tank. And so if you compare that to this, okay, the compost shutter, that's the compost shutter. So the compost shutter, what happens with a normal single lens reflex camera is there's a mirror in it and the mirror has to go kung kung. Now the mirror in here, I'm going to listen to the mirror. I can't believe there's even the mirror going up and down in there. I just can't believe it because it is so without vibration, so quiet. And this was a, a, a factor, if you like, if you're taking candid photographs and you don't want to make a big fuss, if you come to the party with a, with a, a, a large noisy camera, you know, as soon as that shutter goes off, everyone's going to turn around and look at you. And so one of the things of the Leica was that it had a quiet shutter. Leica is actually quieter than that, than that. And that was part of the evolution of the shutter was making it quieter. Now, the Compass shutter, because it's a leaf shutter, it's a rotating kind of a shutter and it's equally balanced, so it doesn't create any vibrations in any direction, up, down, it's circular shutter. And so you could hold, you could hold one of these kind of cameras up, down to a much lower speed. With a mirror based, you know I'm lying, <laughs> I'm sorry. Because this has the mirror in it as well, and the mirror is going up and down, so it's kind of like, it's it's not going to make that much difference with this kind of camera the re, the rangefinder camera you've only got the shutter and so if it's got a, a compost shutter it's going to be very very easy to handhold at low shutter speeds and similarly with the um, with with the cloth focal plane shutter it's going to be good to hold at low shutter speeds. And I've held Leica's at half a second or one second. If you can find a lamp pole to mean up against, you can hold it for one second. Digital cameras I've held for as much as eight or nine seconds in taking pictures at night. And they have, where they have no shutter at all, you can lean up against something and hold it for nine seconds. And, you know, the longer the exposure is, the better it gets because... You know, you kind of got, if you are in movements, they just come back to most of the exposure is where it's not moving. Okay. So, to get back to Comper Shutter. Now, the disadvantage of the Comper Shutter was that the other factor in the development of the camera was that people wanted interchangeable lenses. They wanted to be able to take the lens off and put another one on. So this is the earliest one I have here with interchangeable lenses and this one worked you had a lever over here and you turned it like this and it came off. This was a bayonet fitting. Okay a bayonet and put it back on and it's back again. Right and you could put a bigger lens on it or a wider angle lens. And so people wanted this. And so they wanted to do that with the Comper shutter. The Comper shutter though is in between the lens and the camera. And if you build, a lot of them sometimes they built the Comper shutter into each lens so that when you took the lens off you put another shutter on. That was one way of working so that you could make them any way you wanted. But in this case they, I'll take this one off, I'll show you, you push it here. Yeah. In this one, the, the lens comes off and the shutter stays on and you can see the shutter behind the in, in, in clothes there and you can see how small the hole is and so it limited the size of the maximum aperture of the lens that you could put on it and so this lens here is an f 2.8 which is about as big a lens as you could possibly use on one of these things 
and yet the the industry have moved to f2 f 1.8 f 1.4 even f1 and beyond point f.95 and stuff like this and so um they didn't know the camera cartel didn't know that the future were, that they were designing themselves into a corner but that's exactly what happened and so they were limited to the lens is that they could build for these things and also they used to have them so that the part of the lens was fixed the 50 mil part was fixed and then you put on extension lenses um, so you could put uh, 90 millimeter on or 135 millimeter on the front or wide angle lens over the top and this distorted the image or changed the into the focal lens but they couldn't change the rear element so the designs were limited and they were never as good as a prime lens of you know 35 millimeter or 90 millimeter they couldn't compete with the image quality of those and so at the end of the 1950s towards the end of the 1950s all of the cartel's cameras looked identical to this one. I'll put some pictures up on the screen to show you the similarities. And the only thing that was different about them was the name. You know, they evolved, the cartels had evolved to have, to make style the thing that, that, that would differentiate the different brands of cameras. So the Voigtlander had a strange kind of American look to it go hand in hand with your 1950s Cadillac or something like that and the others Zeiss Icon was a bit more German looking and Kodak was had its own character and I suppose they they wanted to people to buy to keep on buying the same brand of camera you know as you go from from generation of camera to generation, if you'd had a Voigtlander in the past, you'd be likely to buy another Voigtlander. If you had a Leica, you'd buy in the next model Leica and so on. It was only if you had some kind of issue with the brand that you move. And they all had issues with these cameras, that they weren't happy with the cameras, that they looked at the um, cameras that were coming in and um, the single lens reflexes which were, this has a screw lens, the M42 screw was originated in Dresden and this was a camera that revolutionized, it, that everybody wanted to go look at the size of the throat on it and it can take a much bigger lens and so this was the future that they missed out on really and that Praktika won the war in Germany to make the best and best priced and most well made camera for the masses, like the Volkswagen, I suppose. We'll take five. <clears throat> now, I did say that this was the end of the line, but it isn't quite the end of the Voigtlander story because Voigtlander could have been a successful company and saved the whole West German camera industry because it designed and created a really, really, really great camera right at the end of its days in the early 1950s, 59, 60s, something like this. I'm not sure the exact date of it, but I do know that they took the design to the cartel and showed it to them because at that time Voigtlander was didn't own itself. It, it owned less than 50% of its shares, it only owned a third of its, its own shares. And so any development that it made had to be approved by the cartel. And the cartel said, no, you cannot produce this camera because they knew that if they produced this camera, it was the end of them. They'd never sell another one of, of, of that, these cameras. And so they stopped Voigtlander from producing this thing. And then, of course, the whole West German industry collapsed. And in the end, the cartel, the last remaining, the Zeiss Icon producer, Ikerflex, like Icarus, you know, <laughs> rise from the ashes, the Ikerflex 
and it, it just didn't rise at all. It just like they sold none of them. So that was the end of it because they were too late. They took the last Voigtlander, I think it was called the Bessaflex. They took the Bessaflex and they turned it into the Ikaflex and waited six years before releasing the model. And in the end, because you know, they didn't want it to be a Voigtlander, because they owned Voigtlander, they wanted it to be an icon, so it's icon camera, yeah, because they were the major shareholder. And so you can see how they just cut their own throat. <laughs> and it's very interesting parallel between what happened to this cartel monopoly industry in the camera field is happening right now in the computer field because the computer internet uh, and everything to do with computers is now owned by a similar cartel and the same thing that happened in Germany after the war is going to happen to this lot and you can see the same the same war situation uh, is in in the world as it is now we have an east west divide and we have um, chips being made in the west and protectionism against chips being built in the east and you know the developments are all going to come out somewhere else aren't they and so just like what happened in east germany east germany became king of the camera industry okay we'll leave it at that and thank you for watching so far this is the first if you like major chapter end of the first major chapter of the series and the next chapter is going to be about the journey from this to this thank you for watching mm -hmm.